12 years ago when Kofi Annan asked me to prepare a report on migration for the UN, the very first person I called was Kathleen. She is famous for both her depth of expertise and her breadth of concern, and everyone in the migration community has been relying upon her for years and years and years. So Kathleen, the floor is yours. Michael, you are, as usual, much too kind in your introduction, but uh, um, let me say what a very great pleasure it is uh, to be here and to uh, kick off this discussion on the role of the private sector in refugee resettlement. Uh, as, as you all know, refugee admissions are very firmly a government prerogative, but there is increasing interest, I think it's fair to say, um, in many parts of the world, in increasing uh, the role of the private sector in the resettlement of refugees. Let me preface that by saying that, of course, the private sector already plays an enormous role in refugee settlement through our humanitarian, uh, hum humanitarian NGOs, uh, resettlement uh, organizations, through the efforts of civic organizations and communities throughout resettlement countries, and, of course, in the role of private individuals, of church congregations and uh, temples uh, who uh, make a point of uh, making refugees welcome when they resettle in a new community. But there are uh, many avenues for expanding this role, and one that is drawing very great interest is the private sponsorship model, in which Canada has long been the pioneer since 1978, making it possible for individuals uh, coming together in groups or civic organizations to take responsibility for both the financial support and, um, and the integration of refugees in Canada. And we are extremely pleased today to have uh, Mr. John McCallum, the Minister for Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, who is going to um, talk about the potential of the Canadian model to be taken up in other countries. Minister McCallum, thank you very much for joining us. Great pleasure. Well, thank you very much, Kathleen, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you here at the Concordia Summit, but unfortunately, these are two crazy days. And I have to leave by about, in about uh, 10 minutes. But nevertheless, it is a pleasure for me to be here. Partly I have to leave because I have to hear my boss give a speech in the United Nations, and it would be bad for him if I missed that. But what I want to say is uh, three things uh, where I think Canada's experience can help. I mean, I think what we're trying to do is to resettle more refugees. I think not just Australia, US, Canada, the major ones, but try to expand that number. And I think some countries might need advice, which we are happy to provide, because I think one of the things that we have done that I hope is exportable is our privately sponsored refugee model. And just this morning, I made an announcement with uh, uh, Filippo Grandi and George Soros, the, the three of us, the UNHCR, Mr. Soros, and the Governor of Canada, have launched an initiative to try to export this model to other countries who may be interested. And so far, I, can, I know of 13 countries who have expressed an interest, and I'm hoping that more will become interested as we proceed. We will provide technical assistance and advice, and we will tell people not only what Canada did uh, right, but also what Canada did wrong. We've made many mistakes along the way, and so I think we know some of the pitfalls. But basically, I would say that you're way, way ahead of the game if you can engage your own citizens to help bring in and sponsor refugees rather than have them come alone or even worse, illegally. And in our country, this has worked very well with the Vietnamese boat people and more recently with the Syrian refugees. So well, in fact, that I'm probably the only immigration minister in the world whose major challenge is that I cannot produce refugees fast enough to satisfy all these private groups who want to take them in. So I think it is a model which I hope will be exportable to other countries. We are certainly keen to try. A second issue where we might offer um, guidance is we did set up a processing, uh, processing centers 
in Jordan and Lebanon where we did manage to process 25,000 refugees in the space of four months. And I think we did it well from a health and security point of view. So that model could also potentially be helpful to other countries. And the last point I want to make, because I know speakers aren't supposed to speak too long, is to talk about private sector support. Our project evolved into what one might call a national project where Canadians of all walks of life became interested, including the private sector, which contributed substantial sums of money. <clears throat> and the message I want to give you is that a dollar from the private sector in some ways goes further than a dollar from the government. And the reason I say this is that I, as minister, was acutely aware of the point that when executing this refugee program, at no point could we treat refugees better than we treat Canadians. I mean, we had support from Canadians, but that support could dissipate if Canadians got the impression that refugees were privileged. But on the other hand, we needed to support refugees to pay for very high rents in certain parts of the country where rents are high. But we didn't, as a government, want to give rent supplements to refugees where we don't give ref rent supplements to Canadians receiving social assistance. And that's where the private sector came in. They had a program of rent subsidies. They could do that, we couldn't. So I would encourage anybody from the private sector to think carefully about this. I know Mr. Soros has just committed $500 million today, so that's a good lead, um, that's an amazing lead, but please bear in mind that often your dollars can go further than an equal number of dollars from the government. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. I'm, I wonder if I could uh, just follow up briefly on the, on the question of, uh, of costs, which you've uh, addressed in, in terms of the, the money that the private sector can spend on, on services um, and um, benefits for refugees. But what, what does private sponsorship cost the government? I mean, there are things that only governments can do, and you've mentioned the hubs that were set up. Um, to, to process people for admission to Canada, um, the security screening, the health screening, and that. So, and that um, what, what does the government need to commit to in order to um, enable uh, and empower the private sector to participate in this way? Thank you. Well, government it pays, the, we have two kinds of refugees, government-assisted government refugees and privately-sponsored refugees. In all cases, the government pays for the costs of processing, and in the, uh, and, uh, in the case of government-assisted, the government will pay for uh, one year's income level at social assistance levels. Now, in the case of privately sponsored refugees, the government still pays the processing costs, but the individual, the people, the individual Canadians have to pay the transport cost and have to pay income support for one year. Uh, it, however, the government will provide language training, the government will provide uh, mentoring and assistance to get jobs, but the main difference is that the income support for the one year is paid by the private sector in, uh, rather than by the government. But I might also mention that we have an, a, a hybrid model, and this one might be of interest to other countries, where the costs are split 50-50, so that the government will select the refugees from lists provided by UNHCR, and the government will provide six months worth of income, and the private person will provide the other six months, but the government will still provide the language and other training. Thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd like to turn now to um, Johannes Hahn, who is the European Commissioner for European Neighborhood Policy and Enlargement Negotiations, and um, ask you how uh, you envision the private sector uh, participating in increased resettlement in, uh, in EU countries, and whether you see private sponsorship as part of that, or whether you see other models uh, dominating in European countries, and will there be um, guidance at the EU level on these matters, or will it be left to the individual countries? First of all, thank you very much, and uh, <coughs> welcome to everybody. Um, I think uh, first, uh, 
I have to stress again, one has to differentiate between refugees and migrants. Um, and um, Europe, as you are certainly aware, uh, is just uh, facing an unprecedented uh, wave of refugees and migrants. Uh, I'm saying this because very often these people, for, for well-known reasons, are throwing away their, their papers. So it's not clear, are they refugees, are they migrants? They are simply arriving at the shores of the Mediterranean, trying to uh, arrive in, in Europe. Uh, uh, on the Western Mediterranean, we have uh, uh, seen already this year more than 3,000 people being drunken. Um, we could stop more or less uh, the migration or refugee wave, migration wave on the Western Balkan, but uh, this is something with uh, which we have to deal with. Um, if it comes to the refugees, of course, uh, we have to see how we can um, um, distribute them in Europe because uh, some countries are facing, to um, um, so say, high number of uh, refugees and others not. Some refuse to take something, to take somebody. So this is a very, um, so to say, different uh, picture. And in, in some cases, I have to admit, it's not very satisfying. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I would say the, the financial burden for those member states taking refugees is very high because we have also a very high level of, uh, how to say, um, understanding how to deal with refugees. Uh, so in Central or Northern Europe, it's uh, totally unacceptable that, for instance, refugees stay in tents, not even in containers. They have to live in apartments. They have to have access uh, to social allowances, etc. There is also a kind of competition amongst some member states so this is something we have to address. Uh, not related to it, but as a outcome of the economic performance of uh, our member states, we have some countries where we are looking for a skilled labor workforce, and we have others where we have a high unemployment rate, in particular youth unemployment rate. So there are some programs in some member states, for instance, Germany, Netherlands, the country I know best, Austria and others, where uh, companies are uh, working together with public institutions, for instance, in order to offer jobs to people and public institutions are providing um, language courses so that there is um, a win-win situation uh, because some of these companies are very often um, leading uh, global leaders in, in certain specific uh, niches and they are looking for people having certain language skills, and uh, therefore it makes a lot of sense to uh, employ those people coming from different parts of the world, providing them with the necessary language skills of their new host uh, country and uh, use them further on as um, uh, employees, either in the country itself or on certain export markets. So this is one element where the private sector is uh, very interested uh, inside Europe. Uh, I have to admit we have not yet managed to have a common asylum policy, which I believe is feasible in the medium term at least, but which is totally unrealistic is to have a common migration policy. Uh, as I have said, uh, we have uh, different levels of employment, uh, availability of uh, uh, workforce, etc. It's uh, not realistic to say Europe is looking for this kind of uh, professional skills or that kind. Uh, from that perspective, we are far away. This is about the internal situation. If it comes to the external, uh, there we have two interests, I have to admit. Uh, both are related to each other. It's about stabilizing the situation and mitigating the pressure on us uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, a further uh, increase of uh, um, asylum seekers, migration, uh, migrants, etc. Yeah. Uh, coming to refugees, our main goal in particular in our uh, proximity is to stabilize the situation by assisting uh, the immediate affected countries, uh, providing um, money for 
education, but also for food and, um, and health treatment. I think which is, what is extremely important is uh, to provide the necessary financial support to offer education to all children. Um, I have just met uh, the um, uh, Secretary General of UNHCR, uh, uh, excuse me, of UNRWA, dealing with the um, uh, Palestinian refugees. They are always uh, facing um, a budgetary lack. Uh, because, excuse me. Yeah, okay. Well, Thank you. It's, it's a huge range. I simply wanted to inform you about some elements. So what we're doing is to help um, host countries in the, in, the, in the affected territory to provide education. I think a focus should be, and I had some discussions already here in New York, on vocational training. We are always uh, so far focused on the so say, basic education, but what is needed is a vocational training, which is in the interest of uh, business sectors. And uh, to conclude, we have just decided to set up uh, a European uh, an, an external investment fund to provide support to um, countries of origin of migrants, in particular in Africa. Mm. So um, the overall amount which can be raised is 44 billion euros. And this is only possible if the private sector is coming in but it should be seen as a kind of seed financing that the, public, the private sector is trying to invest in countries of origin in order to give people there already a perspective and not to force them to migrate. Thank so you. These are the different elements we can. Um, Thank you. I hope we'll. Uh, I hope we'll have time to uh, come back in the discussion to uh, some uh, points about the extraordinary outpouring we saw from private citizens in Europe as these. Uh, waves of refugees started coming in in 2015 to um, to respond to their needs and so on. But I, I hope we'll be able to come back to that. Uh, first, I'd like to turn to uh, Anne Richard, the Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees, and Migration. Uh, PRM has a, a very close and, and uh, ongoing collaborative relationship with private organizations in the United States. Uh, to resettled refugees, and um, I'd, I'd like to uh, hear from you, Anne, how, how you can imagine that um, kind of collaboration uh, reaching a, a sort of new level um, as we begin to accept more refugees. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex Linica, for talking me into coming today on this incredibly busy week, just what I needed, one more stop. But the good part about this stop is that so many friends and caring people are here. So of course, I'm thrilled to see all of you. Um, um, and I also find this a very interesting setup. I'm sort of waiting for Cirque du Soleil to appear and do something, <laughs> um, which you might consider for a future Concordia. Um, <laughs> So you know that last week, Secretary Kerry announced our goal of admitting 110,000 refugees to the United States uh, this upcoming fiscal year, which starts October 1st. And as Kathleen says, you know, the scale of what we're trying to do, the scale of the refugee flows around the world, and the scale of uh, what the U.S., our, our piece of it ought to be, according to some, or could be, or has been in the past, um, you know, is, is greater than what we are doing right now. So uh, what we uh, want to do is to increase efforts from all of our current resettlement partners and um, undertake creative problem solving and are open to new organizations jumping in as well. Uh, as Kathleen alluded to, U.S. refugee resettlement is already heavily supported and implemented in partnership with non-governmental organizations. And we are extremely grateful for this collaboration. Private citizens and civic organizations have helped facilitate the integration and assimilation of more than 3.2 million refugees that the United States has welcomed since 1975. So we're very interested in exploring in fiscal year 2017 ways to amplify the current large role already played by the non-governmental sector and private citizens in refugee resettlement. In reading the New York Times very good photo uh, display and article from July 1st on 
what the Canadians are doing to welcome Syrians. What struck me was that some of their model is already being done in the United States. We already use a lot of volunteers. We already work through community organizations. We already see Americans organizing themselves to raise money within their communities. We see Americans, uh, business people, oftentimes small businesses, uh, with real good roots in a community trying to uh, provide jobs to, to recently arrived refugees. And, and we also find that when a business person hires a refugee and then is looking for additional people to hire, they'll come back and say, you got any more refugees for me? <laughs> because often they're very satisfied with um, the highly motivated uh, labor pool of the refugees admitted through our program. Um, you know, and a lot of people collect goods and in-kind donations. I heard from a colleague who works in Salt Lake City the other day, they had to stop, this is Salt Lake City, Utah, they had to stop collecting in-kind donations because they don't have any place to put them, they have so many. And uh, that was just such a wonderful thing to hear. Um, so. There already is a lot of this going down and uh, going on, and it's not considered, though, private sponsorship because it's not that final step that is described uh, by my Canadian colleague, by the minister, of uh, really having uh, people raise money for a specific family to sponsor their arrival, their transportation. So we've been learning, and we want to learn a great deal from our Canadian colleagues and are eager to benefit from the lessons Canada has learned and what it might do differently if starting its program today. And so that's why it's so refreshing that the minister is so comfortable talking about the good, the good and the less good from their experience. We have launched a dialogue with the Refugee Council USA or RCUSA on privately sponsored resettlement. We believe the principles that they, you and Melanie, are putting forward to guide additional private resettlement are a good foundation for further exploring this approach. So we will be continuing to work with Refugee Council USA and other organizations interested in private resettlement in the year to come. I would think in the short term, what we would try to do is to launch some kind of pilot to test whether this can be done and try to build some support for the idea. Now, what is our biggest obstacle? I firmly believe that our biggest obstacle is not the mechanics of bringing people here under a private sponsorship program. I think it is uh, the political backlash against refugees. Public opinion polls show that less Americans support uh, resettling refugees than in Canada. In Canada, they have an overwhelming 65%, if I recall correctly, of support from the public for what the Trudeau government is doing. And so I think that gives them a firm foundation for uh, moving forward and really doing more. And um, that is where I think uh, the election year dynamic is not helping us and where I'd like to see us all working together come through on the other side of the election by, uh, you know, con educating more Americans about who refugees are and how they're you know, innocent civilians, victims of wars, families, who will make uh, great Americans. So let me stop there. Thank you very much, Anne. That's a really um, encouraging uh, set of, of remarks, both recognizing the role that the private sector has played and, and seeing uh, future prospects that may open this up even further. Um, Becca Heller, um, your director and co-founder of IRAP, and have done a lot of, of thinking uh, along with colleagues from Human Rights First, from the Urban Justice Center, and uh, from uh, Migration Policy Institute about how private sponsorship might work in the United States. Could you give us just a very brief uh, set of, of points about uh, what you, how you see that uh, possibility? Sure, and I, I just want to mention that that all of our organizations are have been working closely with RCUSA also, and that that IRAP and Human Rights First are members. 
Um, so I think a lot of the principles will be pretty similar. We're coming out with a comprehensive proposal to say, okay, there is interest in a pilot. Um, there is willingness from the Canadians to do training. Let's, let's see some action. Uh, and the, the paper, which you have an executive summary of, describes what that action might actually look like. Um, without getting deep into the mechanics, which are not that interesting, I would say that we think there's a couple key principles. One is the principle of additionality, that any private sponsorship program to bring refugees to the U.S. has to be in addition to the number that the U.S. is funding um, through government programs. Um, you could calculate that as a percentage or um, simply as a sum, but the idea would be to make sure that private funds weren't an excuse for Congress to then cut funding for refugee resettlement. Um, I think another principle that we've looked at is that there sh it should be a partnership between resettlement agencies and local agencies and private individuals. Um, the state of Connecticut has actually done this very successfully, a single local resettlement agency there has been partnering with businesses and religious organizations and individuals, um, and they've provided training for them in how to resettle refugees so you can use the expertise of the resettlement agencies to provide support to the individuals that are doing the resettlement, and through that they've doubled in one year the number of refugees who are going to Connecticut. So our, our paper's gonna look at that as a possible model. Um, Finally, I just want to respond to, to Secretary Richards' um, point and, and say that I think that, that rather than the current political climate being an obstacle to private sponsorship, I would suggest that private sponsorship is a pretty incredible answer to some of the challenges posed by the current political climate. I think there are two main reasons for that. The first on sort of a broad policy level is that you know, Senator Sessions and Representative Goodlatte leaked the presidential determination this year and then immediately put out a press release, oh my God, 110,000 refugees, what will become of us? Um, I think that there's a tendency for refugee admissions in the U.S. to be held hostage to the congressional appropriations process. So if there were a way to supplement that, it would be sending a message to those in Congress who would sort of use the power of the purse to prevent the U.S. from fulfilling its humanitarian obligations that, you know, we will not be held hostage to you. We will admit refugees regardless of this. And the second is on a much more grassroots level. I think that um, it's easy to, to dislike someone who you don't know. Um, and, the, you know, this concept of refugees as the other, the fact that um, so much of the awareness came from the photo of one three-year-old boy, I think that obviously, like, the individual stories of refugees and individual familiarity is going to play a critical role in changing public opinion in the U.S. as well as other countries. I think you saw this huge swell of support in Europe because people couldn't avoid refugees in their communities. So I think that using a private sponsorship model in the U.S. as a way to create direct links between individuals and businesses and organizations and refugees will actually go a long way toward turning the tide of public opinion um, and creating more of a groundswell of support for refugees. And, and while I recognize that there's some um, informal partnering and ad hoc private partnering happening now, I would urge the U.S. government to uh, step forward and make it official. Thanks, Becca. Um, I'm, I'd like to turn now to Melanie Nazer, who uh, is uh, a vice president of HIAS, one of the major resettlement uh, organizations in the United States. And Melanie also uh, currently holds the chair of the Refugee Council USA, which is a consortium of resettlement agencies and other uh, organizations that, uh, that support refugees within the United States. And, uh, as Anne mentioned, uh, RCUSA has been very much, uh, very active in, uh, in recent months and really considering uh, the possibilities of private sponsorship, but more than that is one of the real engines of private sector engagement in many ways uh, with refugee resettlement. So Melanie, um, look forward to hearing from you about uh, how RCUSA uh, works with a whole array of private organizations in the U.S. Sure. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, and thank you also just for all your years of guidance and expertise on all of these <laughs> issues. Um, and thank you to Anne and the administration. Um, we, as RCUSA, are always calling for more, more refugees, more assistance. But in this political climate, which I think is quite challenging, the fact that this administration 
has increased admissions for the last two years and is, this year is on track to actually meet that goal, um, despite all the challenges, I think is a huge accomplishment. So thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna ask a question because I don't know if we're all on the same page. Does everybody, can you raise your hand if you know how the refugee resettlement program works in the US? You know, so if some, maybe it's worth a quick review. Um, right now, it's um, the, U, the State Department actually identifies the refugees, usually through referrals from the UN Refugee Agency, of who actually comes to the country. So um, that's, a, that's a government function. Um, the Department of Homeland Security will interview every single refugee that comes to this country abroad. They, they actually go to, to all these places and inter interview every single one um, to ensure that the person is an admissible that the person is a refugee and that they pass all security and medical screenings. And I'm sure a lot of you have been following the news with all these allegations that this is a program without you know, sufficient security. Um, there is a huge amount of security screening that goes on. Refugees are the most vetted individuals that come to this country. Um, so that gets done. And then um, the State Department will partner with the nine voluntary agencies they're called. These are nonprofit organizations. Um, most of which are faith-based. Um, so we are the Jewish Refugee Agency, but you know the U.S. Um, Catholic Church is actually the largest resettlement organization in the U.S. Um, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service (IRC). Um, there are a number of organizations that do this. Uh, World Relief, which is the Evangelical Church. So we partner with the State Department to decide where we can resettle refugees. We have 350 affiliates collectively across the country and local communities in every state except for I think Wyoming maybe um, where we actually receive the refugees in local communities with our affiliate partnerships many of which are associated with churches and synagogues um, but also you know non non sectarian organizations um, and that is where we really engage the private sector um, and that's where um, I think in all this discussion about private resettlement which is really important for the reasons that Becca outlined um, you know, it's that we do have a mechanism, a hybrid mechanism, where we really do are able to bring in the resources and enthusiasm of the private sector, of volunteers, of local businesses that have been our strongest advocates on uh, for refugee resettlement. Now, are those voices loud enough? No. Do we need a lot more support for a public awareness campaign about the benefits of refugees? Yes. Um, do we need new models? so that eventually as years go on, as this refugee crisis does not diminish, uh, we are able to do more, which we you know, clearly think that the US should be doing. Um, yes, we need all of that. But in the meantime, there's so much that we can be doing um, to engage the private sector even more. And we wanna make sure that people know that there are ways today, while we, de we develop new methods, for people to engage. So just really quickly, um, and this can happen right now, you could um, partner with one of the 350 local resettlement agencies to resettle refugee families. I mean, that happens all the time, but this, this is something that maybe people aren't aware that that can be done. Um, we can, uh, individual and groups can bolster capacity for resettlement by donating directly to one of the refugee resettlement agencies or other community-based organizations that help refugees. Um, depending on the community that you're interested in, 10,000 Syrian refugees have come in, but um, there is no Muslim resettlement agency at this point. So if there are local organizations that are out there that are helping uh, Syrian refugees on the local level, you can partner with mosques or other organizations. That would be great. Um, employing refugees is good business. As Anne outlined, many employers are happy to, to employ refugees, um, provide vocational training, participate in job fairs, um, supplies, ESL. There are lots of things that the private sector does, but we need more of, especially as the numbers increase. Um, also really important and also something we've been trying to uh, find the, the resources for for a long time, recertification and recredentialing of professionals that come here. Um, we have a lot of experienced uh, doctors and other professionals that could be of great service to this country, um, but they don't have the, re the, the credentials. So that's, that's costly. We do that on a one-off basis, but more investment in that would be great. We also have something called the Matching Grant Program, which is an alternative to public cash assistance for newly arrived refugees that basically um, provides services that for them to become economically self-sufficient within their first six months in the US. Um, that could be also augmented by private dollars. Um, so I, I do want to just, um, in terms of the private, we, you know, we have been in, in long discussions about how to set up a private sponsorship 
pilot program because we think that, again, new methods are going to be needed to expand this program. The concept of additionality is really important. We don't want this to be an excuse for Congress that's already inclined to cut funding, to cut more funding. So that's important. Um, we need to make sure that this program in coordinates with the national resettlement agencies. We have a lot of monitoring. Yeah, we have a lot of monitoring. We have a lot of reporting. We have a lot of um, training that goes on with our resettlement. Our, we have a very professional network. We don't want to lose that as we have bringing the private private individuals. I mean, we need to make sure that people are trained and held accountable for, for the quality of resettlement. Um, also to make sure that um, that you know, that maintains the principles of non-discrimination and needs-based access to the program. We don't want to have, you know, certain populations of refugees that have more benefits, better benefits, more access than others. Um, that's, you know, a very balanced decision that the State Department makes, and we don't want that, the private sector to kind of create that imbalance. So those are, those are just some of the things, and I do want to say before wrapping up, um, in, in the talk of all the private sector investment in refugees, I want to point out that um, Interaction, which is the Coalition of Humanitarian organizations just recently announced that 30 of its members, including HIAS and others, um, LARS, um, will be pledging $1.2 billion in the next three years to refugees and migrants. So we also um, mobilize a lot of private resources, um, and I guess I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Melanie, for giving us, uh, giving us that overview of the U.S. program, and as you probably know, the U.S resettles more refugees than um, any, any other country in the world and in most years more than all other countries put together. I just want to make uh, two points, um, and I, I did not make opening remarks uh, because I knew that Minister McCallum had to leave, but let me just make a couple of points, which is that there, first of all, there are currently five countries in which private sponsorship programs operate. Um, they are New Zealand, Canada, of course, also New Zealand, Australia, although Australia's program is not additive, privately sponsored refugees are subtracted from their overall ceiling. Um, New Zealand, Argentina, very small program, and 15 of the 16 German Lander have private sponsorship programs. Ireland and Switzerland have experimented with private sponsorship on a family basis, um, but time limited, and they're no longer in operation. So there is, uh, the Canadian experience dwarfs all others, uh, and there is a great deal to learn from that. Um, most of the private sector contributions we've been talking about have sort of been micro level, at the community level where refugees are resettling um, individuals, uh, congregations, businesses, community groups participating at that level. But I also want to point out that I think um, that there is a, an important role uh, at the macro level as well for private companies and, and for philanthropy, um, particularly in the United States. One of the big questions about costs has to do with health insurance for refugees. And uh, that for a private sponsor to take that on is really a, a, a huge expense in the United States. Um, and that, it, it seems to me, is one area where private insurance companies or indeed philanthropies could help subsidize the efforts of private individuals. Uh, also, some, insur some form of insurance uh, to uh, step in if a sponsoring family has a financial crisis, if somehow the relationship breaks down. Uh, I think providing a sort of safety net under private sponsorship is something that both companies and philanthropies can contribute uh, greatly to. This is uh, um, an area and a subject for, uh, for experimentation. Uh, I think the pilot project uh, approach is exactly the right way to start. And um, Anne, I, I don't know if you um, want, w was there any discussion of this at all at, uh, um, in, in the, uh, run up to the president's uh, summit, or do you expect, um, or in the private sector? Uh, well, we have been talking about private sponsorship was to try to help reach the 110,000 next year, but that hasn't been the central discussion uh, at the White House. And so uh, uh, I, I am 
not willing, even though there is only a few months left in the Obama administration, I would really like to see if we can lay the groundwork to get something off the ground before leaving office. Um, today there is the President's Leaders Summit. There's also a call to action, a private call, private sector call to action with some big corporations coming in to say that they will do more for refugees. So that's potentially big money. And I should have mentioned it before, but I wa was also trying to make the point about how smaller and medium-sized firms can do a lot. Um, in, in One um, example you may have heard before that sort of bridges from the, the very big to the small is Hamdi Ulukayu, the founder of Chobani makes a point of not just funding the Ten Foundation now, but also hiring refugees. And since becoming a successful multimillionaire or billionaire, I, I don't know how much money he has, but it, he's got more than he needs. Um, he has been hanging out with Warren Buffett and, and Bill Gates and, and other uh, corporate titans and going to Davos. And so he's trying to get, you know, really let this catch fire that other, other um, uh, CEOs should should emulate him, and I hope that does indeed happen because I think it's a great it's a great story, and he speaks about it with real passion. Wonderful, thank you. Um, to hear a, a, a little bit more about the Canadian experience, I'd like to uh, ask Jennifer Bond to make uh, some remarks. She's a professor of law uh, at the University of Ottawa and founder and managing director of their refugee hub. So thank you for joining us. Thanks very much, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to add my voice to, to this table. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'll, I'll speak very briefly. I know that uh, we have some time constraints, and there's um, interesting threads to the conversation that others might like to jump in on. Um, I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who has been involved in the Canadian program, both at the policy level and at the grassroots level, um, but more directly today as someone who's involved in the joint initiative that was announced um, and that Minister McCallum referred to um, that aims to share Canada's uh, experiences and capacities and encourage adaptation of private sponsorship in other jurisdictions. I just wanted to take uh, one brief moment to uh, put a few challenges on the table for uh, actors from other jurisdictions who may be looking at private sponsorship. Uh, the first is to think carefully about the scope of the term private sector, and I think there is a tendency to reduce that term to civil society actors, maybe even uh, further reduce it to faith-based groups, or to think about uh, big corporate actors. And, and I think that uh, one of the, the recent experiences in Canada is that they're expanding that term offers uh, a very powerful potential to engage all kinds of unusual sectors. So our post-secondary institutions are engaged. Uh, we have um, different sized businesses involved. We have municipalities who are themselves privately sponsoring and so on. So, so think carefully if you're, if you're looking at this space. Uh, it can go well beyond uh, the traditional large donor or small faith-based group. Um, the second uh, point I'd like to make is that what these actors can do can also vary. And so again, there's a tendency, I think, to point out the financial benefits. Um, there certainly are those. I would uh, add to hard cash uh, that it's helpful uh, when you're setting up private sponsorship to consider the infrastructure, the actual mechanics of the infrastructure, and the fact that uh, private sponsorship takes some of that out of government and puts it into communities, which can be very beneficial quite aside from uh, the financial side. Um, but they're also able to really provide a type of support that is unique. And this is uh, something that some states, including the U.S., have, have already worked on, and they have some established resettlement streams which would complement private sponsorship quite nicely. Other states um, haven't done as much building of that uh, local infrastructure, and I think that there really is an opportunity to use private sponsorship not only for the immediate uh, refugee resettlement goal, but also to build infrastructure, which will help with your state-based sponsorships um, and also generally grow capacity in the sector. Many other roles, um, but I just want to encourage you to, to don't stop your thinking at uh, dollars and cents. Um, and the third point, and it's already been mentioned by a few of the speakers, but I really want to underscore it, this is not only uh, a project or an opportunity to think about bringing in uh, more persons. It's not entirely about numbers um, and increasing resettlement spaces, though there certainly is that opportunity. And I think the global project hopes very much that there may be increased overall resettlement capacity 
um, through growth of private sponsorship streams. But it's also a very powerful tool to impact that bigger narrative. And, and I think that Becca made some, some key points here, but certainly the Canadian experience has been that by having a decentralized system, by having refugees that are very much brought in by local persons, supporting by local persons in our communities all across the country, that that has facilitated government action. And, and I, I recognize a bit of a chicken and egg situation, but I think that um, when speaking about Canada's recent initiative, very important to note that at a time when our government was not taking a leadership position on this file, Canadians were mobilized by the tens of thousands because they had a vehicle. So providing that vehicle is critical. That then provides a way for this expression of support, which in turn can facilitate bolder political engagement. Um, so I would encourage you to think about that in its um, multiplicity and, and sort of nuanced way. Uh, again, I want to say that I'm delighted to see um, the support of OSF, UNHCR, and Canada to think about this engagement if there are other states either who are quite seriously considering private sponsorship or who aren't and are really just having some questions. Um, the goal of the initiative is to try to provide more, more information at one end of the spectrum and also provide uh, much more support in whatever form makes the most sense. So we look forward to working hopefully with many of you uh, in coming weeks and months. And uh, again, I'm delighted to be here and add my voice to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much for that and, and for pointing out, I think, especially that it's not just about the numbers, in addition about to the broader public engagement, I think it's also about quality of resettlement. And there have been some uh, study of this in, in Canada that shows that refugees who are actually privately sponsored rather than government sponsored um, have better outcomes uh, over, over time, at least in the first sort of five years after resettlement. So it's, it is, it's numbers, it's quality, and it's um, part of uh, building public support for, uh, for refugee programs. Um, I am very sorry to say that we are running out of time. We have maybe one, uh, one or two comments. Very, very briefly, if I'm sorry to put that constraint on you, but can we start here and, and there and just one point? Sorry, very briefly. Um, my name is Julia Onslow Cole. I'm head of global immigration for PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, thank you very much, Michael and Kathleen, for chairing these very interesting uh, sessions. PwC were very privileged to work with UNHCR and OCED on a series of round tables we've been holding with employers across Europe on employing refugees. And we've had these sessions in, in Brussels and Copenhagen. And it was a really excellent way to get employers together who are actually having really uh, meaningful schemes and employing a lot of refugees. And the thing that we discovered, and there will be a, a, a full report, but one of the things that I think and we, it was really came out of all these meetings is that business are really keen to engage, but often they just don't know how to. And I just wonder if we could give them a little bit more support, like, for example, setting up and identifying skills available and putting that to business and helping with language training, that then it would get more schemes off the ground. So I think if, if a bit more support could be given to business, I think they're really receptive, but often they just don't know what to do. Thank you for that, uh, for bringing to our attention the PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, activities, but also making that extremely important point about having uh, the importance of having a vehicle, which um, uh, which Jennifer also also raised. Um, and final. Comment. Thanks, Thank Sasha Chanoff with Refuge Point. Thank you to Concordia. I wanted to make a few brief points. A couple about the need to provide information here in the U.S. One, that I think it's essential to promote understanding about the rigorous process that Melanie talked about in terms of the vetting. Sometimes it takes up to two years for a refugee to arrive here. We can do better than that, but the public needs to know that. Secondly, that refuge actually refugees contribute to our economy. If you look at uh, Lewiston, Maine, Utica, New York, St. Louis, Missouri, you see examples of Somalis, Bosnians, and others who've regenerated depressed areas of cities. These are really important messages. And lastly, we have to recognize that while about a quarter of the refugees globally right now are from Syria, three quarters are not. And when we think about resettlement, we have to ensure that those, no matter where they are, 
or where they're from need to have access to it as a life-saving solution. And UNHCR is making great strides in collaboration with Refuge Point, International Refugee Assistance Project, and many other organizations to ensure that refugees are being reached no matter where they are. Thank you very much. Um, that's a good, uh, a good note on, on which to end. And I want to thank all our panelists, and including those who had to leave. Thank you.